Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Harvey Andersack, and I am the president of the BC Wildlife Federation. I'm very much, I'm very pleased to see so many people attending, especially from the other fisheries organizations. I want to note uh, that all uh, First Nations people uh, living on the Lower Fraser were invited to this forum. This forum is sponsored by the Federation and like-minded conservation organizations with financial support from HCTF, the BCCF, and the Freshwater Fishery Society, and especially the Ministry of Forests, Lands, Natural Resources, Operations, and Rural Development. Somewhere in that huge ministry is our interest, known, commonly known as the Fish and Wildlife Branch. The ministry is represented here today by the Director of uh, Fish and Aquatic Habitats, uh, Jen Davis. I believe she's a little bit late, but she will be here later on this morning. This forum is coming about due to ever-increasing frustration by all of us over the decline of the interior Fraser uh, steelhead and other weak salmon stocks. And the lack of willingness on the part of DFO to make changes to the current methods of fishing on the lower Fraser. DFO stubbornly holds on to non-selective fishing methods that pleases the commercial fishing sector while annoying fisheries conservation groups that are in this room today. For more than three decades, like-minded conservation groups have argued to no avail for change to more selective fishing methods. If we don't have a change in selective fishing methods, the trajectory that uh, interior Fraser steelhead and other stocks are going to continue to go towards zero. For sure, there are many other factors that contribute to the decline, such as ocean survival. But fishing methods are the primary factors that something can be done about. It should be obvious that DFO can and should make the changes necessary. The problem, of course, is that DFO has conflicting mandates. One of conservation, and the second is to ensure a continued viable commercial fishery. So far, only the commercial fishing interests have been served at the expense of conservation concerns. Change is inevitable, as we have seen changes from examples such as horses to cars, calculators to computers, and huge changes in the current forest industry compared to three and four decades ago. It is time for DFO to get on the bandwagon of change. <clears throat> This forum is not about telling anyone how they should fish. We are here to learn and review what many of you already know about selective fishing methods. Ironically, later on today, we are going to hear about pound nets. But then I'm getting ahead of myself, of course. What we need to first hear about are the many challenges that steelhead and salmon face as they mature in the ocean and begin their migration back to, the, to their natal streams. Our keynote speaker will start us off on that journey by giving us an overview of what we know about ocean conditions today. Easy because I'm going to ask all the speakers to come up to the front and there will be an opportunity for a little while to ask uh, additional questions. So if the speakers who I know none of them are shy, Rick, uh, would you come up please and uh, and the rest. Anyways. Okay, so uh, we're going to open it up to further questions. I know that I had to cut a few people off to keep on track, but uh, now is your chance to ask some additional questions.
troublemaker. Um, yeah, the whoever group you're working with is going to put more uh, resources into the project if they're going to get more money for the fish that they're harvesting. So, yeah, you can uh, definitely you just look at how much more you can get for the product and compare it to your costs of of handling the fish differently or treating them differently. I could have showed you some slides where every fish was oriented in exactly the same direction and, and uh, treated in, in a very special way. Sometimes, the ones you saw for the pink salmon fishery, they were minimizing the cost by minimizing the handling and the fish just went right into a tote and then were towed across the other side of the river and, and offloaded quickly. Whereas if you're handling every fish individually, your labor costs are going to be higher, but you may get a, a better product, and maybe that'll offset the, the uh, additional labor costs. Uh, one thing I didn't ask was what the labor costs were for the uh, operating the, the trap, um, you know, how many people you need for that. So that might be a good thing for you to answer. Yeah, for our current trap design, it takes about three three people to operate a trap. Um, and into the future, I could see that coming down to about two. Um, so that's what we're lo looking at currently. But of course, in a, a research setting, the, the costs of everything are just are skewed. You have more people out there than, than you necessarily have to um, in order to gather all this information, collect the data. So um, I feel like it, the research setting, it doesn't quite translate um, to the commercial fishery setting. But it, it takes about two to three people to operate a trap. And that would be uh, my projection into the future. Yes, next question, right over here. Gord? Uh, either the trap or the uh, wheels, or preferably both. Uh, what do you do about getting a fishing license, and how does it affect the ability of the gill netters to still catch fish? Like, can they keep the same number of licenses? Well, I don't think it's been an issue at this time for any of the work we've done. The NAS is really regulated by the Nishka Lissom government, so they make their own rule in the river. All right. In the Fraser, it's never been used. Uh, we did use it in 2009 and 11 for the commercial. 2011. 2011. And for the Matsqui harvest uh, for the uh, First Nation there. And that, so it's not really had any competition with the gill netters in river, and you're talking about a relatively small portion of a huge run of pinks that year. So I don't think that uh, conflict potential has ever come up yet. Sorry, what was the... Well, I don't think we've really thought through that yet. I mean, if the trap became highly effective, you'd have to include that catch in the total fishing mortality, and so it could potentially reduce opportunities outside. And that uh, it would have to get very large before whatever hap that would happen. <laughs> that, so. Okay, Mel, do you have? I just said uh, oh. in response to that. Yep. that it's really important, actually, the issue of. Of where, what the allocation for the fish wheel or trap is coming out of. So, on, on the, in the Niska case, it comes out of their treaty. So, they have a treaty allocation, and they can, and their treaty is written in such a way that if there's any commercial or recreational fisheries targeting NAS sockeye or, or any NAS species, they can harvest and sell. They can harvest for food or sell the fish if they, if they so decide. Uh, in the case of the Fraser uh, Tuasan First Nation, I also work with, that's right near the mouth of the river. Um, they had a pink allocation in, in 2011 and didn't have a way of accessing the pinks effectively that was going to be of interest to the market. So they teamed up with Matsqui and they provided the herring skiffs and the totes because they have those for their sockeye fishery and, and uh, work with Matsqui to, to do that project together. And uh, in the future, Matsqui is very interested in using the fish wheels to harvest for food social ceremonial purposes. 
and I was talking with Stan earlier today, and he said, yeah, the, they're, they're having problems with uh, people having the time to get out on the river to catch food for the community because they're sitting behind two large, three large fleets. They've got, uh, for the food fishery, Tawasson, Musqueam, and Catesy all in front of them. And, and they don't have the same uh, type of fishing gear. To, uh, so they've got to go out and fish really hard with smaller boats to catch a few fish. And the fish wheel can operate 24-7, be selective, and, and meet food needs, putting aside the whole issue of commercial. And, and it's really important to recognize that there, while there's some groups, and it was made earlier comment was, you know, what is really food? What is, what's a food fishery versus what's a commercial fishery? There's a lot of groups out there that just want to catch food to feed their families. And this is a good way of doing it 24-7, all, all week long, as opposed to focusing in on a two-day weekend. And you have a chaotic fishery when you have just two days. Okay, Mel. Thanks, Harvey. I wanted to ask Mr. Toey earlier, and I actually got a chance to at the table, about predators, if they were a, a challenge at some of these stationary traps and through some of the other selective fisheries. Um, I'm just wondering if we've heard from the commercial fishermen that are releasing fish off those um, sluice gates or whatever they're out, out over the side of the boat. Are predators a problem there? Um, predators are typically a pretty, um, well, they have a brain. They can learn where to come back to for a food source. Um, if predators have been a problem at any of these other release sites, basically. I answer can on the fish wheel case, we occasionally catch the odd seal in the fish wheel that is coming in looking for uh, chasing some fish. Um, we never catch the same one twice. Um, <laughs> explain why. Um, and uh, the working with First Nations has some advantages. And um, but the, uh, it's rare, yeah, that when they're in there with a bunch of salmon, there's a lot of carnage goes on when that seal's there, but it doesn't happen very often. And that's one of the reasons why we use them on the Fraser, because uh, seals is a significant predation problem. So I'm curious to know whether you had any of those predation problems with your pound trap. Yeah, so at, at the trap, we, we actually have a marine mammal, mammal deterrent device um, at the entrance to the heart compartment. Um, obviously, if you let a whole bunch of seals get into your heart, you could have some, you could have some serious problems for your gear and for the fish. So we, we have a, a gate that allows fish to pass through and sea lions and seals can't pass through. And so that's been, that's been pretty effective as long as your gnats are completely flush with the riverbed. And that's a very important thing when, when you're operating a trap to make sure that nothing can get into your heart except those fish. Um, but still, like any gear, um, it's, it's not perfect. And you have uh, sea lions um, along the lead on occasion, which are chasing fish. But unlike, say, a gillnet, those fish have somewhere they can swim. They're not lodged in the gillnet and plucked down. So you know, the trap isn't perfect in that sense at all. And, um, but it's, you know, most gears, at, except probably the fish wheel. I bet the fish wheels, um, you don't have too many interactions, and it, it sounds like you don't. Um, most gears, you know, well, seines as well. You get marine mammals that'll jump within the seine. Tangle nets or gill nets, you have uh, sea lions or seals plucking fish out of a net. And so it's, it's fairly common to most gears, and, and the trap is no exception to that. Okay, Ken. Yeah, the, the question for Finn, uh, relative to what Rick was saying, it, it just seemed kind of bizarre that Kosiwik has this option of having that emergency fast track, and then when it gets to uh, when it gets to Ottawa, it kind of grinds to a halt. That's like having the fire department come to a house on fire and then take a lunch break. Uh, would there be any appetite for like a private member's bill so that that the uh, legislation under Sarah or something, if it got an emergency listing, it could speed up the whole process rather than having everything treated the same? Uh, that's a really good question. I think um, it would be a, a very difficult to change that process that drastically. I would, 
you know, I obviously want to see that. I fight for that, and I've uh, raised the issue of uh, endangered species and listed species uh, in Parliament. Um, but I think the the two dominant parties, uh, I know certainly on my experience for the last 10 years, absolutely resist uh, the notion of restricting ministerial uh, uh, discretion. So the notion of, of uh, trying to speed that process up so that uh, they don't have that kind of power to make decisions, which is essentially uh, jobs and socioeconomic uh, considerations. Um, I, you know, I would be in favor. I would. I, I think that's what we're at. I mean, I think we're we're looking at issues right now that have been become very obvious over decades, uh, and I don't see our you know past governments responding very quickly or well to that. And I, I think it's it's been noted in in uh, a number of the presentations uh, about the entrenched bureaucracy that's there, and it's been built over time. So, I, yeah, I don't think you can uh, wave a magic wand with a PMB to make that happen that quickly. And it'll come down to political will. A government has to want to do it. Uh, so, you know, if we, we have to, I think, um, you know, get the public on side with doing the right thing when it comes to uh, protecting endangered species. Okay, next, oh, Al, Martin? Yeah, this question is to uh, Dr. Welsh, uh, particularly with respect to the lamppost effect. Uh, given that uh, we appear to be on the verge of uh, new investment in uh, fisheries and fishery science, uh, what area of uh, marine uh, research and assessment do you think uh, uh, would be the greatest opportunity for uh, gaining knowledge uh, on uh, on how the systems work and uh, uh, wh where should it be directed? Well, you can direct it here. I've got a card if you want to send it over. <laughs> <laughs> but I th that's the obvious answer. Um, the most immediate gains that we can get over the next five to ten years <clears throat> is to look at how much of the poor survival is happening uh, in the Salish Sea. Um, so uh, Brian Riddle and the PSF have funded the Salish Sea program. Uh, we've got some really interesting results there. Um, but one of the really striking uh, pieces that we've got is that uh, the size of adult salmon coming back in has dropped dramatically. So we know that's probably Bison, who's in the back, has told me that is true for interior Fraser uh, steelhead. Uh, it's certainly true for sockeye, so far as we can tell. It's certainly true coastwide for Chinook. So I think that there's pretty good reasons to think that both the smolts going out and the adults coming back in have poorer survival in the past, substantially. And we've got one unpublished piece of work that we did with uh, Scott Hinch at UBC. Um, the adults coming back in have about the same daily survival or weekly survival rates as the smolts going out. That doesn't fit with the way fisheries biologists were taught to think that the, the problem's just in the early stage. So it may well be that it's the adult fish coming back in that have a lot of the higher mortality. You know, it could be Pacific white-sided dolphin or something like that that's uh, picking them up as well as, you know, as pinnipeds. So really nailing that down and quantifying that would be a really big step because you know, the, the open ocean, the Gulf of Alaska, is a very big piece of territory. We, that's going to be hard to work at. Uh, we don't have the technology probably to do that directly. But if we take off the piece of the smolts going out and up the coast for the first two, two three months of their life, and for the adults coming back in, um, you know, what's left by by default is by subtraction is what happened out in the ocean over in the open ocean over a couple of years but we don't know what's happening to these adults coming back in uh, you know the, we've got bits of evidence that the survival rates are no better per week than the smolts going out that 
you know, if that's true, um, that's a very big change in how we would think about these fisheries. And it may be possible to modif modify something uh, there if, if, if that actually turned out to be true. Yes, next. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, the youth of the world are, are looking at things totally differently now. And, and to one example, they're looking at the oil industry, and big oil has always been in a, uh, pushing, because they've got a lot of a clout, and they're turning against it because of the climate warming. When I hear what's going on here today, it seems that gill netting is something that basically makes the fish that aren't the ones being uh, sought after expendable because the mortality rate is 50% of, of what is caught in that gill net is, is expendable because it's not going to survive. It goes back in the water. Has the time for the gill net come and gone? And, and what are we doing about making the gill net obsolete so that we can catch fish and not sort of make the other fish in the water expendable because we're, we're going to use a gill net? I think Brian Riddell should answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of people here would say yes, and I think that, uh, well, you heard Finn, that there is an environmental petition that was under, yeah, yeah to ban gill netting. I, that, that discussion has started, and that's why I asked the question earlier about acceptability of the trap net. So you have a transition that's going to go on here. I mean, the, the biggest, I said this this morning. You know, there's the biological issues with selective harvest and that, the mortality rates people argue over all the time. The fundamental challenge will really be more the social, economic, cultural change and how you're going to organize the fleet. We still have a Fraser River gill net allocation, right? So if you're going to replace that in a more efficient type of fishery, then we have to work out how we're going to share the benefit across those fishermen. Or we have to pay them to retire. That's another part of it. So this discussion has started, and that it's an interesting analogy, I guess, but I think it'll be a few years down the road. Yeah, this is why it's, I think it's critical that these fish are listed under the Species at Risk Act, because if they are listed by the federal government, then it becomes immediately illegal to kill, harm, or harass them, which I think everyone agrees gill nets do, most, most seriously, so this will help drive that change that's required in society to accept alternative things, accepting um, the maybe ec some economic uncertainty about pound nets and things. As soon as you drive that societal change, people will start to look at alternatives. But until they do that, until they say, oh, well, you know, we'll cover it under the Fisheries Act, which, which by the way, is one of the reasons that ECCC does not list thing, marine fishes, is to say, oh, don't worry, we got it covered under the Fisheries Act. Finn articulated very well about how many, well, we all know the changes of the Fisheries Act that happened, so, and, and the, the long time it's taken to not only put back the things that Harperites took out, but to improve it, as, as the NDP is trying to do. So to rely on an act that is still dewatered and is delayed in getting it back up to strength and even improving it, to rely on that and say, oh, well, we don't need to cover them under SARA is absolutely ridiculous and irresponsible, in my view. I'll consider Rick undecided on that. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Can I mention one thing? Yeah. Okay. One thing I just want to quickly add is yeah. um, I think as we <clears throat> legalize alternatives, because currently in, in the Columbia River, basically the gill net is the law of the land. I think as we legalize alternatives and, and likely uh, fishermen who are using these lower impact gears 
they're able to fish for longer and they're catching a product that's worth more and they could sell it at, at a higher price, I think there's going to be a natural transition um, that'll take place. Um, so I, I think uh, <coughs> market forces really could drive it as long as we legalize alternatives because currently they're illegal. You can pass it if you have just also to add on the youth comment, uh, uh, Mel and I on the fisheries committee have had uh, a number of young people under 30 fish, fish harvesters come uh, to the standing committee to present uh, because they don't see a future in, in the uh, commercial fishery for them. They don't find it uh, that they can make a living, they can't buy in, they can't buy licenses, uh, they can only lease. Um, so they're looking for change as well, and I think uh, you know we're at a at a very good time right now because we have these I think these overwhelming pressures that are going to force change for us to be innovative, and we've got young people that are saying, look, we can't do status quo, and they're willing to look at innovation. So I think it's going to be up to I, I completely agree with what you're saying about get get the public on side, social media, etc. Um, and force the, the politicians to listen. I think that makes sense. So there's a number of things that are coming together, uh, but again, it has to be very focused and, and pressured. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to quickly sorry. add that um, even a gill net can be selective in if it's fished in the right area. Like if we move <coughs> to more terminal areas where we're selecting for populations that can sustain, sustain harvest, that's another way to do it too that needs to be part of the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to comment on that, but I have a question for Carl. <laughs> so, well, you know, yeah. Just hold on, Bob. We have a fellow that's been waiting a very long time in the back there, so go ahead. Let me defer. I want to hear what he has to say. <laughs> um, my name is Walter Bergen. Um, I feel like I've been in a different church today with all the acronyms that I've had to learn in order to understand what you're saying, and it's been a pleasure. Um, as a citizen, one of the comments I hear is we've got to get the public on side, and I think that one of the things that we need to do is create some drama for the public that the public will understand, and the way to create drama is to charge those persons responsible for placing the, the North Thompson uh, steelhead, charge them with gross negligence of their responsibility as public servants. Would the courts case win? Probably not. Would it create some drama and get you on the National Post and the CBC? I expect so. So one of the things we could do is we could walk across the street to the Suzuki Foundation and ask them if they've got some money to hire a lawyer to charge somebody in debt DFO with gross negligence of their responsibilities as a civil servant. Okay. You want drama, you want the public on side, that's a place to start. Okay, thank you. Bob, did you have a question then? It, yeah. A little oh. bit tangential to that, but but Carl, you're, you're the most connected person, I think, in the room by far in terms of, you know, interacting with the First Nations communities. And, you know, I, I'm curious, like you mentioned earlier that you're dealing with Matsqui and Tawasin and, you know, there's some agreement between them and on, on how they're going to go about doing some business there. Well, I make it from the DFO announcements about various fisheries that there's 27 or 28, I think, First Nations names that show up on the Fraser between, say, uh, I don't know, whatever the creek is there up above Yale somewhere is the, the lower Fraser boundary between there and Tawasin. So... Do you have any thoughts on, on, on how you can somehow get cooperative approaches along the corridor so that you're not dealing with one-off situations all the time that are basically in competition with one another? Yeah, that's it. The Fraser is a complicated place to work because of First Nations. It's too bad more of them couldn't be here to answer that question directly. I will try on behalf of some of the ones that I work with. Um, you're trying to affect change. The only way you're going to affect change is if you have some positive results. Uh, why, the earlier question was, why was that fish wheel that was deployed in, in 80, or 98 and 99 not still fishing? Uh, 
because there was no resources uh, and there wasn't the encouragement to do it. Why is it going to be deployed again this year for the first time in more than 20 years? It's because people are recognizing this is an issue and you've got to start somewhere with a positive story, just like your traps on the Columbia. You'd never see a trap on the Columbia if somebody didn't take the initiative and have a good, have a positive news story. Um, the fortunate thing is there's, there, because there's a, a team of uh, people involved from Tawasson to Matsqui to Yale, you're covering the spectrum of the lower Fraser. It's not going to mean that if we had Ken Malloway and others in the room, they'd go, hey, this is great, and let's do it everywhere. No, people will have to see that it, there's something that is working, that is benefiting First Nations, and going to benefit the resource before they're going to jump on board and try to convince all their constituents, which are their populations that live on their reserve, and they're people that don't have much money, and all they can afford is a little bit of gillnet mesh and a float and a lead line. And that's why that's what you see in the river. It's because it's low cost gear. Why do we not see every community running a fish wheel? Because then it's a communal fishery. And the way the fishery has been managed is by individuals going out and getting a chance to get some fish for their family, whether it's food or getting some money for their, uh, their, their home because it's a, a sales fishery. So this is starting small. Yeah, it's not as fast as everybody liked to see happen. But it is starting, and there is going to be real incentive now with these closures. When is this fishery that going to happen this fall? It's going to be September, October, when we're going to be running these fish fields. There won't be any other fishing on the river in September and October because there's concerns about steelhead and coho. And so people will be seeing, hey, there's somebody fishing over there with the selective gear, and we can't fish. We also got to work on DFO. I was talking with Brian. We got to get you know, right up to the top level saying, you can't just say that the people with fish wheels can fish two days a week because two days a week with a fish wheel is not going to catch enough fish to feed a family. It needs to be fishing all through the week. And plus, you don't want to have to process all your fish in one day. You want to be able to go out there every day, take some fish, bring it home, treat it properly, go out the next day, and then maybe start sharing with other, other groups and get more people involved in the successful fishing process. So it takes time, and it's taken me the better part of 20 years to get groups back interested in doing fish wheels. And yeah, I work with all these groups, in, on the, a lot of the groups in the Fraser, not all of them. Uh, we work on sturgeon issues with a lot of them, because sturgeon is a, an issue. And we work throughout the province, yet it's still tough to get the change to happen that is so embedded in the core of their, of their culture uh, to have individuals being able to go out and fish on their own as a family or as an individual every day, every day that they're open. <laughs> OK, thank you, Carl. Uh, Ed, you're next. Do you have a question, Ed, or? I made it very clear at the beginning of this uh, forum that we are not here to tell anybody how to fish. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think Carl answered your question in part. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I want to make one more mention about this uh, um, gillnet uh, fishery petition, which is important. It's what Finn took to the House of Commons, and and we were somewhat involved from the Sturgeon Society side to to try and propose a solution that we thought uh, might work for gillnets. That's why the petition says no unattended gillnets on the Fraser River. And what that means is that, yeah, the, in, a, in the transition period, uh, if you want to increase survival of fish, then when a fish gets caught in the net, you check in to see, is it the one I wanted to catch? Is it a sockeye? Is it a, a coho, if you're allowed to keep coho or other species? But if it's not, get out there and release it right away before a seal eats it. And there's, there's no, none of the groups I've been talking with think it's unrealistic to say, if you're fishing a gill net, you should be on that net because nets also get left on the side of the river. And then are, when the water levels come up, they get swept in and they become ghost nets. And we've had a program for two years working with First Nations to get the ghost nets out of the Fraser River. And for two reasons, the ghost net issue and the, the making the fish, uh, making the most out of the fish you catch, the, it's, it's just critical. And that's a regulation that could be put in place without a lot of pushback from a lot of different groups. Not everybody would agree with it, but when people see it's an even playing field, you want to fish with a net, you got to be fish, you got to be on that net. And if there's any nets on the river unattended, they can be removed by an enforcement officer. Talk to the enforcement officers and they said that's something they can do much easier than going in and telling people they can't fish with nets. Okay, I think this well, could be the last question. I just had a quick question and then a statement. Well, I got I lots of questions. Hold up, Bob, Bob, Bob. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just wondering, this is a great meeting. and Thank you so much, PCWF, for putting it together. This is uh, groundbreaking stuff. And I'm just wondering if this is going to uh, lead to a bit of an alliance among groups here and start working and developing a plan, a strategy quickly in action as quickly as possible. Are you guys working towards that? And then I just want to make a statement after you've spoken, a short one. The, the quick answer is yes, and Aaron Hill uh, has volunteered to uh, address that after dinner tonight, okay? So there will be something said about that. And I just wanted to avail myself as an advocate. Uh, I worked six years as a veteran advocate uh, for disabled veterans that got their pensions taken away in the middle of the Afghan war and uh, was the lead plaintiff on a lawsuit that uh, managed to equate to several billion dollars being spent in the last three, four years on veterans' uh, issues. And uh, my name's Aaron Bedard. I think Finn Donnelly would vouch for me that uh, I've done some very groundbreaking work through social media. I'm a sneaky little son of a gun, and uh, I could be very helpful to this group. So I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Bob Hooten. Yeah, Carl, were you aware that uh, that the DFO enforcement clan seized 250 nets in the Fraser last year, and and that they that was with the least effort, patrol effort in the last five years. I knew they were doing more effort on that in the last few years. Okay, so 250 nets. That that's a lot of unmanned nets. And the other question is that you said earlier that there will be no fishing in September and October this year. Where's that coming from? That's the that's the closure for for proposed closure for coho and, and steelhead that they're not going to be uh, any com any commercial fisheries <laughs> happening. Oh, big difference. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. No commercial fisheries happening after the, the Labor Day weekend. There'll be still some uh, First Nations uh, food fisheries happening on weekends, which is economic opportunity. Uh, Escapement surplus to spawning requirements. You no, know, it's that gray area between conservation and okay, no, there's Bob, the FSC. There's no Bob, ESF. You, sorry, you, you and Carl Fraser. can talk about this offline uh, during dinner or whenever. Uh, I, I really appreciate everybody hanging in here. It is getting to be a long day now. And um, I'm going to change the order of the agenda just ever so slightly and ask Ken Ashley to come up here and we're gonna change gears a little bit because there's a, uh, a little film clip that we'd like to show you that the BC Wildlife Federation as well as Watershed Watch uh, are, are involved in. It's called the Heart of the Fraser. So Ken, if you wanna come up here. 
Yeah, thank you very much for all the speakers. <laughs> and I, I feel bad to be uh, interrupting your uh, dinner conversation here. Um, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, they just asked me to sort of talk about what ne next steps might be on this uh, really important issue. And I do want to thank, um, thank the Wildlife Federation for putting this together. Um, it's, a, it's a really important conversation. Uh, great presentations from important experts. It's so wonderful, wonderful to hear from uh, you know, Dr. Riddell, uh, uh, David Welch, Rick Taylor, um, about um, all of your important research and experience, and you know Carl English's presentations on all the excellent work that he's been doing with First Nations over the years on getting fish wheels in all those rivers in BC and Alaska. Um, I remember being super excited when I first saw a fish wheel uh, up up on the Skeena when I was a kid up there, and uh, and, and on the Nass as well. And it's great to see that kind of stuff happen on the Skeena again. And really exciting to hear about what the Wild Fish Conservancy is doing, and, and hopefully we can get something, get a pound net going in BC here pretty soon. Um, this this is a very important topic for my organization, Watershed Watch. We've been pushing for harvest reform, for increasing selectivity in, in our salmon fisheries for as long as we've been around. And we've been doing this through advocacy, through drawing attention to the problems of the mixed stock fishing, um, and supporting important research like uh, what you heard from Dr. Cook and others. And most importantly, I think working with First Nations harvesters to um, support them in rebuilding their historic fisheries and, um, and making them an economically vi viable reality. Um, we've had a strong focus on that, uh, on the Skeena, through our fisheries advisor, Greg Taylor, who has a long history in the industry. And he's been working for many years with the Lake Babine Nation to revive their ancient fishery um, at the Babine at the Babine Fence, and we uh, they had an exciting tipping point this year in that um, over two thirds of the commercial catch of Skeena River sockeye happened in in river stock selective fisheries um, done by First Nations, and so the the tide really is shifting on this issue, and and what we need to do is is make it happen faster and make it happen right. And one important thing um, that we've been pushing hard for that we think needs to happen hand in hand with a shift to more selective fishing is excellent monitoring and compliance. And um, one thing that Greg always says is that selective fishing without fishery independent monitoring, that's monitoring that's not collected or reported by fishermen or the fishery, but that's by an independent third party, um, is essential if we want to have effective and transparent fisheries that are actually accomplishing the conservation objectives that we're purporting that they will. And most, most salmon fisheries in BC right now aren't compliant with um, DFO's own strategic framework for fishery monitoring and catch reporting. And, and that goes for selective fisheries too, and we, so we need, to, uh, we need to make sure that that goes hand in hand with this push. So um, beyond that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's next. Um, there's a lot of power in this room amongst the conservation and uh, angling groups that are, are pushing on this issue. Um, there's broad public support for this. We uh, did a public opinion poll. We had Angus Reid do a public opinion poll several years ago that's widely quoted about how wild salmon are as important to the B people of BC as the French language is to the people of Quebec. One of the questions in that poll was, um, it was do you agree or disagree with the following statements? And one of them was that um, the extinction of small salmon runs are acceptable as a trade-off for the commercial fishing industry to maintain their current practices. And there is a broad no to that one. Um, there is strong public support for fishery management reform to protect endangered salmon stocks. So we're not a special interest in this. We are. This is this is mainstream public opinion that we're that we're trying to that that we have behind us on this. Um, so, and the, the 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 problems are screaming at us in the face with these endangered salmon runs. And we have the solutions in front of us. And so, and we have the power. So, so we can make it happen. We need to get organized to exercise that power and bring the solutions to bear. And so I think that's where, that's where there's really room for improvement in getting all of the different 
groups that are advocating for this together, speaking with a common voice and a, on a common call to action um, to, to really make it happen. And we have two, there's a couple of areas of you know, important strategic, strategic opportunity right now. The BC government is showing a strong interest in um, wild salmon, but um, <clears throat> the people who are sort of running the show on that one are very old school commercial fishing types, and um, they kind of want to bring back disco um, with respect to the commercial fishing. And, and we need to convince them to look ahead and embrace stock selective fishing, pound nets, fish wheels, um, and, other, and other techniques with strong monitoring and compliance. And we have a critical moment of opportunity right now where they're taking the recommendations of their industry-dominated advisory council and developing a, a BC wild salmon strategy. We have a couple weeks right now where we need to really influence them and tell them that we want BC's wild salmon strategy to focus on increasing selectivity in our, in our salmon fishing. Um, another area of opportunity is the upcoming federal election. And um, I think that one's kind of self-explanatory, but again, it's just the idea that, that we should all be uniting around a common call to action and getting all the political parties to um, put in their platforms um, explicit, strong support for shifting to more selective salmon fishing methods. <clears throat> um, and then I guess another, another big lever um, to make this happen would be Sarah listings, right? And it was really good to hear um, <laughs> from uh, Dr. Taylor about uh, his experiences in that, but um, we do, it'd be great to, to break the mold here and actually have, um, have a marine fish species listed under Sarah and uh, use that to light a fire under everybody's butt to get this uh, selective fishing stuff a reality more of a reality. Um, and the last thing I'll say um, is that we really need the harvesters at the table for this. Like th this was a really good, important conversation, uh, but I, we've all acknowledged that the key harvesters that are gonna make this stuff happen aren't in the room. And there's a, there's a lot of trust that needs to be built up and relationships that need to be formed there. And there's, um, there's a, there's a big cultural gap in particular between the angling community and First Nations that are, that are slowing us down on, on progress here. So that really needs to be addressed and um, we all need to step up and, and make that happen. Um, and so, I, and I think that really involves developing one-on-one -on -one personal relationships with the, the key people, the key First Nations leaders who are who are going to make this stuff happen and and make so that the next time a, a conference like this happens that um, that there's trust in place amongst those the key people so that they feel they feel comfortable coming and being a part of the conversation um, I'll leave it there um, oh I'm sorry there's one other thing um, and I think it goes back to this uh, the both of the um, the wild salmon strategy and the federal election but as part of that, we need solid long-term commitments um, from the federal and First Nations governments to ensure that there's longevity um, for the infrastructure that's put in place and the economic benefits that accrue to the harvesters. And I, was just, I picked that up from listening to Carl's talk about um, how, in some cases, you know, the stuff gets built and then there's not the, the long-term support and commitment to care for it and, and make sure it lasts. So anyways, that's it. Thanks again. Appreciation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Harvey. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Aaron. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> we're coming to a close rapidly here, uh, and I appreciate your patience. Uh, just so you know, uh, the question is: so what? What happens from here? Uh, our office will be sending out a survey to each and every one of you. Uh, with ideas about how we move forward from here. So this isn't the end, this is just the beginning. So thank you very much for your time and patience. Thank you.